Hi! Today we're going to talk uh, some more about fluids. Mainly we're going to talk about pressure, but we really have a mixed bag of things to do. So first we're going to write out Archimedes' principle. And secondly, we will talk a little bit about density. Density is a factor that appears in Archimedes' principle. Third thing, and one of the main things we'll do today, is define and discuss pressure. And finally, we will look at the connection between pressure and the buoyant force. Okay, so let's talk about Archimedes' principle a little bit. And Archimedes was a famous Greek fellow who uh, was working with the king, and the king was worried that um, the crowns he was getting were not made of pure silver or pure gold or whatever it was he wanted. He thought the craftsmen maybe were trying to cheat him by doing lead at the core, and so Archimedes was trying to figure out some way to uh, investigate this. And in any event, what he found was that the buoyant force acting on an object is proportional to the volume of fluid displaced by that object. Okay, so that's a nice qualitative statement, but we can also uh, make a much stronger statement than that, and this is really what Archimedes' principle is about that the buoyant force acting on an object is equal to the weight of fluid displaced by that object. Of course, the weight of fluid displaced is equal to the, is proportional to the volume of fluid displaced. Okay, but here we really get an equal sign. Buoyant force is equal to the weight of fluid displaced by the object. So that's Archimedes' principle stated in words. And here it is as an equation. So the buoyant force Fb is the mass of the fluid displaced times g, that's the weight of the fluid displaced, m times g. And we can write mass as density times volume, so we get the density of, of the fluid times the volume of fluid displaced by the object in the fluid multiplied by g, that is the buoyant force. And again, this thing that looks like a p is actually the Greek letter rho, and rho is our symbol for mass density and density, mass density again is mass divided by volume, mass per unit volume. Okay, so let's look at density a little bit more and we're specifically talking about ma mass density. So once again mass density, rho, is the mass per unit volume and density is very important for fluids. So if you want to know whether an object is going to float or sink in a fluid, all you actually need to know is how does its density compare to that of the density of the fluid. If the object has a lower density than the fluid, then the object's going to float. If the object has a higher density, it's going to sink. So the actual weight of the object is not really what's important. It's the density that determines whether it floats or sinks. Okay, so we can also talk about specific gravity. Sometimes you hear that. And a specific gravity is a ratio of the density of material to the density of water at 4 degrees C. So why do we pick this funny number, 4 degrees Celsius? There must be something special about water at 4 degrees C. Any idea what it is? And it turns out that that is when water is most dense. So water is actually a very unusual fluid. Uh, it's an unusual substance, really. So, um, usually when you cool things down, they generally, the atoms and molecules get closer together and the density just keeps increasing. Yeah, it keeps, uh, yeah, increasing. But um, water, if you're at 4 degrees C and you get cooler, then what happens is crystals start forming and the crystal structure has lots of uh, space in it and so you actually get less dense. So the solid form of, of uh, water, of course, ice floats in the liquid form. That's quite unusual. Okay, so for example, aluminum has a specific gravity of 2.7. So what does that mean? Well, it means it's 2.7 times more dense than water at 4 degrees Celsius. Okay, so let's consider some densities. So we've got a table here and the values in the table cover about 39 orders of magnitude. Now most of the things are concentrated in the middle. 
So interstellar space is not exactly perfectly empty, but it's pretty darn close. A density of 10 to the minus 20 kilograms in every cubic meter. Air is pretty close to 1, and we're in units of kilograms per meter cubed. Okay, so water at 4 degrees C and at 1 atmosphere has a value of 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. That's equivalent, that's exactly the same, as one gram per cubic centimeter. Okay, so these are the same numbers, just in different units. But our, we're going to use kilograms per cubic meter here, and so we have these pretty large values. But remember that water is a thousand. So water compared to air, there's roughly a factor of a thousand between them. Uh, the Earth is, on average, about 5.5 times the density of water. Uh, and then you've got mercury, which is very dense liquid, 13.6 times more dense than water. And if you go to a black hole, then you get to a density which is enormous. But you're not going to find too many of those around here. Okay, so now we should talk a little bit about pressure. So how do we define pressure? So the, this pressure we're talking about is force per unit area. So take a force, divide by the area, you get your pressure. So, in, this is important in terms of uh, forces exerted by fluids, okay? So, what happens is there's an air pressure inside whatever room you're in, or outside if you're walking around the street. And this pressure actually comes from forces associated with molecules that are bouncing off of you, or off the walls of the room, or whatever. Okay, so you see this picture here, molecule comes in, hits a wall, bounces off, we assume it's an elastic collision, and so it changes momentum. This molecule feels a force to the left from the wall on the molecule. The molecule therefore exerts an equal and opposite force back to the right on the wall, or on you, or whatever. Okay, so uh, all these things you cannot actually see Air molecules bouncing off actually exert lots of force on you, collectively, when you add it all up. The SI unit for pressure is the Pascal, and the Pascal is just force over area units, so one Pascal is one Newton per square meter. And we're going to do some things with atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure is around 100,000 Newtons per square meter. And that's amazing, particularly when, once again, it comes from collisions of air molecules bouncing off things, and you cannot even see these air molecules, and that they, yet, over a square meter, they exert an enormous, enormous force. We'll talk more about atmospheric pressure in class. Okay, so let's talk about pressure in a static fluid. So first of all, we really need to know what a static fluid is, but it, it is what it sounds like. It's a simply... It is simply a fluid that's at rest. And in a static fluid, in general, the deeper you go in the fluid, the bigger the pressure gets. So pressure increases with depth. And also, in a static fluid, two points at the same vertical level are at the same pressure, independent of the shape of the container. Okay, so all that matters is what vertical level, level you're at that determines the pressure. So here's an example of a container. Two points are marked, point 0.1 and point 0.2. So point 0.2 happens to be a vertical distance h below point 0.1, not directly underneath, but that doesn't really matter. And so all the dashed lines that are at the same level as point 0.1 have the same pressure as point 0.1 does. All the dashed lines at the same level as point 0.2 have the same pressure that point 0.2 does. And there's a nice, easy relationship between the pressures. So the point 0.2 has a higher pressure than point 0.1 because it's lower down in the fluid. And so in general, the pressure at point 0.2 is the pressure at point 0.1 plus the density of the fluid times g times h, where h is the vertical distance that uh, point 0.2 is below point 0.1. Okay, and once again, point 0.2 does not have to be directly under point 0.1. Uh, 
All that matters is the vertical distance. Any horizontal displacement is irrelevant. It doesn't change the pressure at all, at least in a static fluid. So you can exploit this idea, P2 equals P1 plus rho GH, to measure pressure. Okay, so here is a device shown in the picture, which you might call a manometer or a barometer. It's just a pressure measuring device. Okay? So most of this thing is open to the atmosphere, but the tube in the middle is closed off at the top. And what happens is at the very top you've got very, very low pressure inside the tube in that small gap of air, basically at the top of the uh, fluid column. Very, very low pressure. The other end is open, open to the atmosphere, so it's at atmospheric pressure. And in order to maintain this column of liquid, in order to so it stays like it is, you have to have that pressure difference. Okay. Now if the atmospheric pressure changes, then what's going to happen is if the pressure, atmospheric pressure increases, that's going to force more liquid up into the tube. If the atmospheric pressure decreases, then some of the um, uh, water in the tube is going to come down, okay, and the, the level of uh, fluid in the column is going to be less. So you can actually measure what the current atmospheric pressure is with a device like this. So you can just take H, the height of the water column, okay, and you can say 0.2 at the base of the water column is the pressure at 0.1 at the top of the water column, which we're assuming it to be zero here, plus rho GH, okay. And depending on what you use for your liquid, you uh, can get a small row or a big row, depending on whether you're using, say, water or, say, mercury. Uh, then you get G and then you get H. Okay, so you can use that to actually measure the pressure at the bottom, which is atmospheric pressure in this case. Okay, so the final thing we're going to talk about today is the origin of the buoyant force and how it's related to pressure. So here we have a cube, purple cube, in a beaker of liquid, okay? And this cube is fully immersed in the liquid. And so what we're going to look at is, and this is not an equilibrium, okay? So we pushed it down, we let it go from rest from that point, and this thing is going to feel a net upward force, the buoyant force. But this buoyant force comes from all the different pressure times area forces on each of its faces. Okay, so in other words, the net upward buoyant force happens to be the vector sum of the various forces associated with the fluid pressure applying force to the different faces of the cube. Okay? And what happens here is that pressure increases with depth. So here we're showing four force vectors attached or being applied to the cube. There are actually six. Okay, so let's look at the black ones. The black ones, there's one going right on the left face of the cube. There's one going left on the right face of the cube. Now because those are at equal depths, they will simply cancel each other out. There's another pair of arrows on the front face and on the back face. They're applied at the same level on the same area face, so those forces also cancel. Now the ones at the top and the bottom the area of the uh, cube is the same on the top and the bottom, but the pressure is different. The pressure is bigger further down. Okay, So the upward pressure times area force exerted by the fluid on the bottom of the cube is a smaller force than the downward pressure times area force exerted by the fluid on the top of the cube. So then you've got a net force. So you add as vectors the force on the top downward plus the upward force on the bottom and you get a net upward force and that is in fact the buoyant force. So here we have our net force is the difference in pressure between the top and the bottom of the cube multiplied by the area of one of the faces of the cube. And the change in pressure is just given by rho gh where h is the height of the cube and now we've got h times a, and the height of the cube times one area of the cube is actually the volume of the cube. So here we have density of the fluid times g times the full volume of the cube. And that works if the cube is fully immersed. 
Now if your object is floating in the liquid at the top, at the surface, then your h will not be the uh, full height of the cube itself, but it'll be the height that's below the water level. And so then you're going to get your net force, your buoyant force, is your density of the fluid times g times the volume of fluid displaced by the object. Because it, it will involve the area times the h that's below the water level. Okay, so there we go. That is Archimedes' principle, but it actually is neat to see that it comes from pressure differences at various parts of the cube. And it's a little harder to do this for, you know, irregularly shaped objects or, say, spheres or whatever, but you do it for any object and you can prove that this is the same result. F net is density of fluid times g times volume displaced. Okay, so this is where the buoyant force comes from. It arises from pressure differences associated with the lower down you get in a fluid, the bigger the pressure gets. Okay, so that is everything for today.